Welcome to the Sankofa Pan-African series. Please support us through Patreon and by buying me coffee so we can continue to bring you this series. Subscribe if you've not yet done so and please turn on your notification buttons so you know when we have new episodes. And of course, share our videos with all your contacts. Our guest today is Professor George Elliot Clark, a Canadian poet, playwright and literary critic who served as Poet Laureate of Toronto from 2012 to 2015, after which he served as the 2016-2017 Canadian Parliamentary Poet Laureate. He is one of Canada's most illustrious poets. He is also known for chronicling the experience and history of the Black Canadian communities of Nova Scotia and New Brunswick, creating a cultural geography that he has coined Africadia. He earned a, a, a BA degree from the University of Waterloo, a master's from Dalhousie, and a PhD in English, all in English from uh, Queen's University. He has received numerous honorary degrees from Dalhousie University, the University of New Brunswick, um, the University of Alberta, University of Waterloo and St. Mary's University. He taught English and Canadian studies at Duke University from 1994 to 1999 and was appointed the C. Graham Visiting Chair in Canadian Studies at McGill University um, for the academic year 1998 and, uh, to 1999. In 1999, he became a professor of English at the University of Toronto, where in 2003, he was appointed the inaugural E.J. Pratt Professor of Canadian Literature. Professor Clark has also served as a noted scholar at the University of British Columbia, a visiting scholar at Mount Alice University, and he was the William Lion Mackenzie King Visiting Professor in Canadian Studies at Harvard University between 2013 to 2014. Um, Professor Clark will be sharing some of his poems on peace with us, as well as his rather interesting um, take on sustainable peace building and the global um, uh, politics. Please join me in welcoming Professor George Elliot Clark. So I'll just say a little bit about a little bit about this. So this book is uh, Canticles One, and yes, I am George Elliot Clark, as the title or the, rather my name might suggest here. Um, and this is the first volume of what is likely to be six volumes wow. of an epic poem, and this first uh, volume. Uh, is dedicated to poems dealing with slavery and anti-slavery or abolition, emancipation, uh, and resistance to slavery, but then also imperialism and resistance to imperialism. And so I do use some fictitious characters, but I often talk about real historical subjects and, and I try to re I try to um, uh, talk about them as realistically as I can. So the first poem I want to read, uh, going back uh, a couple thousand years is, of course, uh, about uh, Julius Caesar and his uh, conquest of Egypt, and and uh, and the way that he succeeded finally in defeating the Egyptians was to uh, set his boats on fire, and but there was an unintended consequence of that uh, military maneuver, that military tactic, which was the destruction of the ancient library of Alexandria, uh, black civilization, uh, whose library probably held the original volumes of all of the works of philosophy and poetry and, and theology of antiquity were probably all there and most of it got burnt up thanks to Julius Caesar. 
Pope, who was no friend to enlightenment. So <laughs> Incidentally, here I've actually done an episode on the burning of the library at Alexandria. That was why I was so excited when I heard your poem um, wow. on, on, on Thursday. So viewers, if you have not watched that episode, please go and check it out. It's one part of a four part series that we did on ancient Egypt. This is exciting. So here is the poem, Alexandria Alight. Sunshine charred to smoke, saith Plutarch of the Tsar. Julius Caesar exhibited syphilitic blindness, refused to recognize beauty as justice or justice as beauty as at Alexandria, Egypt, 48 BCE, that untimed time. In his putsch to dethrone Ptolemy to rout the obstreperous Egyptians, and so he waxed incendiary. The gypsies were so havocing his sails, so disrupting his seaborne siege, Caesar fretted that his patchwork armada would fritter into tatters, become cracked open carcasses, mass floating coffins, his sailors bloated like rats dead in the drift or look bedraggled rats clinging to splinters caesar scrupled not to skipper but to scupper his vessels that impenetrable unreachable egotist wagered on letting his seamen burn alive his tars set flames jetting along ropes set flames streaking meatoric through rigging so that his stagnant heart would stay the turbulent dismay that's defeat. He had to stave off the death threat that's defeat. Drastic scowls shattered his face, better to arson his navy, make smoking fiery unholy funerals of his fleet, char waterlogged wood to charcoal chips so that each burning boat resembled conniving dandelions. Caesar's ships were soon floating fires intended to render Egyptians ash, swamp their soldiery in blaze, smash their machines to sparks and cinders. Once awash in salt spray and foam, Roman sailors now pinpointed helpful breezes, placed their torches, and were soon awash in ash. But Caesar's commands, rolling off his tongue like water off his back, showed him a debauched prima facie arsonist. So eager to bitch at and pitch down Ptolemy, so eager to have the Egyptian perish with the taste of disgust in his mouth, to know miserable, dreadful humiliation, to be humbled, then tumbled into a grave beneath a pyramid of cadavers. Caesar needed not just ruins, but gore. He ordered that any sailor jumping ship without first setting it alight would land, spit it by swords. Now the Roman navy was blazing, drifting, and so soon had the city waterfront, all its docks, wharves, piers, equally burning with stomach-churning effect. Each blazed galley was a luminous contaminant. Sparks rode waves of superheated air. Cinders took flight, too. These miniature torches rained on the port. The harbor witnessed birthing fires, galleons aflame, looking massively imposing as pyramids, but pyramids imploding, dismantling once calm water singeing even the sea. And the irregular and flesh-eating arson made lime-white bones of soot-blackened bodies. Thus the flooding fire swallowed up the dockyards, then chugged and charged, churning through all of Ptolemy's palaces, shaming the abashed architecture into ruins. Shortly, the kindled lightning of Caesar's smoking hulks, his marine-born 37th legion, that melange of roaring bees incinerated the great library, liquidating 40,000 scrolls, account books, ledgers, histories, theologies, poetry, all gone to smog and smut, all teased to smithereens and tatters. What was lost? 
books good to prop up unbalanced kingdoms or teeter-totter marriages or lopsided tables. Eventually, rainbows soothed the sea, but Alexandria's great library was empurpled, charring. Songs gone to cinders, poems gone to pulp, philosophy gone to unpardonable swill, even theology, gods got dragged through garbage, worm-chewed garbage. Imagine Osiris, half burnt, his guilt face singed. Caesar's chronicle triumph, his capture of Alexandria was regression. To exterminate the library, to set parchment, smoking, robustly, pages blackening unrelentingly, while cheering with wine the aching stories of Egyptian groans enacted a masterpiece of immorality. Such constant history is our dispiriting inheritance, but words still throng into song, thrive and thus meet eternity alive. Dante's glittering ink, par exemple, or Leighton's crowing lungs, or De Wiseau's plumes of letters, all arrive as impotent as sparks, or as the lighthouse beams that silver the wrecks of inglorious tyrants, and the seaweed graves of sunken assassins and arsonists, to tell us liberty is priceless, not gold, that the poet enters a pantheon of equals, the perennial pinnacles, emissaries of wine, that their great strumming is fire that never dies down, that encumbers otherwise unencumbered darkness. When did you write this? It is uh, the 6th and 9th and the 17th of February, uh, 2016, and written in Enfield, Nova Scotia, Burlington, Ontario, and Ottawa, Ontario. The reason why I, I am asking is, is as you are reading it, I, the image of the destruction of Damascus and the centuries, you know, of artworks destroyed, you know, so wantonly just kept coming to my mind. And I'm like, yeah, and, and, and like you said, it is a constant in our history, this wanton destruction of, you know, of sources of knowledge, this repression of, you know, knowledge that arises from, you know, certain parts of the world. It is it, 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 just so sad yes. that centuries after the burning of Alexandria, it's, it's still going on. Uh, we can think of the American invasion of Iraq in 2003 yes. and yes. the destruction of all those antiquities. I mean, yes. the fact that that President George W. Bush had the nerve to station American troops in front of the Ministry of Oil yeah. and to let mobs ransack the museums. And was then to really fully now show them around the world. It was a crime against humanity that they let that happen. That's and what's happening now in Ukraine. And, and right now, in, exactly. Yeah. Exactly, it's the same thing. It's the same thing. Uh, and I can think of the uh, insurgents in Mali uh, in, who threatened the ancient library of Timbuktu and all those yes. scrolls that have never been transcribed, never yes. been published and so on. Yes. And yes. so, I'm against imperialism, but the only uh, good thing that France ever did was go to Mali and try to stop that destruction of of uh, of those uh, uh, antique scriptures and texts and so on. Because, excuse me, once again, I have no quarrel with anybody's religion, none whatsoever. Everybody's everybody in my mind is free to worship and love whatever divinity or divinities they feel like worshiping or loving. Uh, and obeying for that matter. On the other hand, when you start to destroy human heritage, yeah. as as the Taliban did when they blew up the, the Buddhist uh, statues uh, early in, in uh, uh, 2003, mm -hmm. uh, sorry, 2001, uh, that in itself was was a time, instead of waiting, instead of, of reacting to, to the uh, destruction of the World Trade Center, in particular in New York City in 2001, 
George W. Bush, if he'd had any real care or concern for humanity, yeah. should have stopped the Taliban from blowing up those millennia old Buddhist statues mm -hmm. in the spring of 2001. And if the Americans had intervened to prevent that catastrophe from happening in March 2001, maybe 9-11 never would have happened too. Mm -hmm. If in fact they had put defense of human culture first, there may not have been a necessity to deal with the grief and and the tragedy of the destruction of the World Trade Center towers uh, in in September two thousand one. Yeah. So, yeah, of course, the mistake most of us make is thinking about imperialism as an just the economic or military, you know, um, um, oppression or hegemony, but. In, in the mind, the, 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 this, this desire by, um, by a group in this world to dominate all forms of, uh, of knowledge creation, to, to be in charge of uh, canonizing and all of that, it's, in fact, it's the worst kind of imperialism because it is what allows economic and military imperialism to thrive. Which is what I love about this, your line about poets in a pantheon of equals. <laughs> yes. So that just jumped at me, you know? Yes, I mean, the fact that you're one skin color or that you were born in the U in, in, in the economic North and things like that does not give you, you know, um, any more, um, what do I say it? How do I put it? does not make you a better poet than even an unlettered person who has been raised in the oral tradition yes. you know, of creating a poetry, a philosophizing, you know, through their poems and all of that. It's brilliant. <laughs> well, uh, I'm so happy that we're having this conversation and, and so on. And we all need to have these conversations more and more often because uh, we cannot depend on mass media to allow these conversations. Social media too now. Yes. You know, with the the way in which big money is being thrown at the ownership of social media, the yep. monopolizing of That's social right. media. That's right. Uh, going on. <laughs> yeah, it's it's the same old, same old, same old, same old, same in, old. in that uh, people with people with money want to be want to be people with power. Yeah. Rich yeah. states want to be powerful states <laughs> and they will buy up everything and they will try to control everything in order to maintain their own privilege and their own power. Mm -hmm. And no one should ever be surprised by that. Yeah. So, no, I don't celebrate Elon Musk riding to the rescue of free speech. Free mm -hmm. speech. Exactly. Free speech by, by who? By whose standard? Ex you know? Yeah, that's right. <laughs> and, and for whose benefit? For whose right. benefit? So, because uh, so much speech is suppressed, so mm. much of it anyway, yeah. in terms of, of it not being heard, not being aired. I mean, right now, uh, given the atrocious war that's underway in Eastern Europe that Russia has launched upon Ukraine, formerly a part of Russia or part of, of yeah, the USSR, uh, the USSR, um, uh, why don't we have, why aren't we hearing reports of peace movements here? Why is the news media solely concentrated on how many weapons we can send Ukraine? Thank you. Uh, as opposed to wondering about, are there Canadians, are there Americans, are there uh, uh, Europeans, Western or Eastern, who are interested in trying to see a negotiated settlement come about in Ukraine? Uh, keep in fact, which is what should have actually preceded all of this, which if if it had been uh, if they had been given airtime, might have even prevented this carnage. And I'm and I'm willing to predict <laughs> that 10, 20 years from now, when we look back at this moment, when the full truth comes out, a lot of people who are trying to pose as heroic now are not going to seem so heroic later. <laughs> um, we can remember. Uh, the run up to the invasion of Iraq in 2003 and the propaganda that insisted that Saddam Hussein had weapons of mass destruction. Oh, he didn't have any. Yeah. And, and they knew it. Yeah. They knew it. Their intelligence agencies were telling them they didn't have any. 
it's, but it all got spun yeah. around into into yeah. we've yeah. got to invade before he can launch an atomic bomb at us yeah. and and it was complete falsehood but who paid for that yeah tens of thousands if not hundreds of thousands of iraqis paid for that mm. and just as we don't have any confirmed count unfortunately and it's morbid anyway of exactly how many people have died in the ukraine conflict so far yeah. we got to keep in mind the americans also never kept track of the many thousands of Iraqis who died as a result of their invasion and also as a result of their sanctions. Mm -hmm. And if anybody's going to be called up for war crimes, George W. Bush is still living. <laughs> he should go to the Hague as well and be placed in a little glass box along along with the along with Putin, along with uh, other thugs yeah. from other regimes. Yeah. Just yeah. because somebody says I got elected and he's got and he's got uh, uh, a whole lot of millions of votes behind him. So did Trump have millions of votes, millions of votes behind him. So did Hitler have millions of votes behind him. Yeah. Just the yeah. fact, just because you're elected doesn't doesn't give you a halo. Does not, comes, even, does not even guarantee that you are sane. You know, <laughs> seriously, <laughs> they, don't give, they don't take mental exams to actually test their sanity before they put themselves up for election. So, and we know that the line between sanity and insanity is so thin. You know. And this idea that one country or one segment of the world must be in control of the world, you know, it just doesn't make sense. And we'll come back and talk about this, but- Yes, we will, uh, we will. Anybody who has doubts about, about where we are in the world right now only has to look at, look at an atlas and look at a list of economic statistics and military statistics. The truth of the matter is, that the northern half of the globe is perversely rich, over rich, overdeveloped. At the expense of the rest of us, which is at the expense of the rest of the world. We're not making enough. You know, absolutely. Absolutely. The, the wealth of, of the North and Europe is still on the backs of Africa and the developing world. Why is, has the Republic of Congo never been allowed to know peace? I agree. The country which has some of the world's richest natural resources exactly. has never known prosperity. And wow. which was and uh, a part of the world that was looted by Belgium. Yes, and continues to Belgium. be looted today by multinationals. Yep. Yes, exactly, exactly. And 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 you know we can't we cannot afford to be blind to reality to facts, and that is that the northern half of the globe has enriched itself at the expense of the south uh yeah. from the very beginning of the age of imperialism 500 years yeah. ago yes. right down to the present yeah. and as the north has become exorbitantly rich because of exploiting the raw resources and the labor through enslavement and and underpayment of laborers from the south so has the so-called west which is really a europe and its extensions of north america and australia new zealand uh, and other uh, white majority states uh, mm -hmm. around the world. Uh, the so-called West is also the greatest military threat to world peace. Yes. When we talk about the West, the West has the vast majority of all the weaponry on the earth. Of mass discourse. And they want to keep it yeah. that way. Why? <laughs> yeah, why? So they can continue to sack and pillage yeah. and loot and oppress <laughs> and repress and suppress yeah. as they wish. And then wave the flag of we're for human rights. Yes. They are the, you know, I, I got to quote Malcolm X. They are the world's greatest hypocrites. They the world's be. greatest hypocrites. And yes. I do not blame African nations for saying we don't want to have anything to do with your, with your war crime tribunals and your human rights tribunals because the only people you are ever interested in condemning are Africans. Yes. yes. Or people of color. Yeah. Well, well white dictators. Yeah. And elected white war mongers yes. can run around the world doing all kinds of of massacres up yes. the, and pay for massacres yeah. from along this remote massacres do yeah. massacres by by drone strike. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure you won't want to miss the rest of this conversation, which will be continued in the next episode. Please support us through Patreon, and by buying me coffee so we can continue to bring you this series. Subscribe if you've not yet done so, and please turn on your notification buttons. 
Don't forget to share our videos with all your contacts. And of course, keep those comments coming. Thank you.